I felt like it's been a little while since I've made a New Vegas run, and we all know that you New Vegas fans need your fix. A few ideas came to mind, but one that has come up somewhat consistently for the last two years since the Pocket Sand video was to make runs based around the other unique unarmed skills you can learn. Like many, the most memorable one to me is the Ranger Takedown, so I decided to make it the focus of the video. Plus, I play a lot of Mortal Kombat, and I felt like it had the potential for me to make some Mortal Kombat related jokes and references. Whether I do or not really depends on how long it takes for me to write this script, and if I even remember to put them in. The Ranger Takedown is activated in a similar way to the Pocket Sand, only this time you hold back with the attack button as opposed to left or right. Unlike the Sand, however, the animation for the sweep only happens in third person. If you do the move in first person, it'll still have the same effect, only it will be replaced by a palm strike instead. While this wouldn't fail the run, I think the kick looked better, so I stuck with it for every encounter, plus I ended up finding it easier to land with in the third person camera. Now with all that out of the way, let's begin. As my guy is about to be the living embodiment of the sweep kick, I thought it was only right to give him an appropriate name. The build is straightforward. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's almost identical to how it was in the Pocket Sand run. A focus on strength, endurance, intelligence and luck, but also two points in charisma for a slight boost of speech at the beginning, simply because I need a speech skill of 30 to get the Ranger takedown in the first place. I could go to Ranger Station Charlie and help out there, but I'm a bit of a klutz and would probably blow myself up with a landmine. Back to character creation, and I just went with unarmed and speech. It should be pretty obvious why I'm going with those, and as for my third tag skill, well, nothing really jumped out at me, so in the end I just went with medicine. After all, more healthcare is never a bad thing. Unless you're American. Finally, for traits, I went with built to destroy and skilled. One of them gives extra crit chance at the expense of faster weapon degradation, and the other boosts every skill by 5 points, with the drawback of 10% less XP. Considering both negatives can be very easily nullified with either a perk or just having stuff for repairs, they are nothing to worry about. I also take skilled almost every playthrough because whenever you leave Good Springs and are asked to rebuild your character, you can just take the trait again for an extra 5 points without another XP penalty. So really, there is no reason to not take it. From this point, my path is clear, I need to get to Novak ASAP so that I can start defending myself. All I did in Good Springs was head to my recently renovated grave to grab the snow globe. Sure, my luck may be high enough to guarantee I become public enemy number one of the casinos, but the less time I must spend doing that, the better. The fastest way to Novak would be heading through Hidden Valley, and from there through the Scorpion Passage just next to it, as it does spit you out right at Helios 1, which is of course just next to Novak. I, however, ended up taking the longer path of just following the road through Prim and Nipton. Sure, it's good for marking locations on the map to cut down the backtracking later, but truthfully, I just didn't go the faster way because it's been three months since I last played New Vegas, and I genuinely just forgot that that was an option until writing this part of the script. It's not a huge issue, other than it taking slightly longer, I just make sure not to come into contact with anything that can kill me until I get to Novak. I made a very brief pit stop at Wolfhorn Ranch, one, to see the majestic Bighorners in all their glory, and two, for the reinforced leather armour that is almost always in the shack. Almost always is right, as of course it was not here today. It's a tad disappointing to be sure, but we can make do without. From here, it's a very short walk over to Novak, and from there to Ranger Andy's house. I quickly mash through his dialogue, pretending to care, also I can get past the level 30 speech check and get access to the takedown. Now, as the name would imply, it can be used to take down or trip up your opponents, kind of like how the sand was supposed to have the effect of blinding your enemies temporarily. And, just like the sand toss, the damage of the takedown is entirely dependent on your unarmed skill and whatever unarmed weapon you have equipped, which, again, makes about as much sense as before. I didn't want it to be the exact same as last time, so rather than getting the two-step goodbye and turning everyone into a potential time bomb, I instead just went with an ordinary par fist that I was able to buy from Cliff Briscoe for a little over a thousand caps. It's not the best unarmed weapon by any stretch of the imagination, but we can see about replacing it later, as there's actually quite a good few fist weapons that could help us out a lot. Seeing how I'm also somewhat going down the path of a luck build, I took two minutes out of my day to steal the Bill of Seal from Jeannie May, so that Boone can practice his skill of shooting unarmed women, making him available as a companion. We'll not be taking him along of course, but he does reward us with a first recon beret, which offers an extra plus 5 yard crit chance, so it's worth doing just for that. It does also level us up, where every point is just used to improving my kicking, and the perk point is spent on Swift Learner to get me back to normal experience gains. With a fist, a hat and a new fondness for kicking people in the shins, I return to Prim to see just how effective it could truly be. 
I had some trouble at first getting the kicks to land. After all, the most consistent way to pull it off is to just power attack while moving backwards, which tends to mean I am walking out of the range of the attack. You can hold down the power attack first and then pull back at the very last second to perform a sweep without moving, but you will then need to be consistent with your timing, otherwise you're going to end up just punching someone in the face, which is of course against the rules. In the end, the best way to engage in combat was to just run backwards towards my enemies. That way, whenever I started up the sweep animation, I would already be heading towards them. It seems effective enough, so hopefully it's not too tedious or awkward. Yeah, okay, so the absolute power behind this fist that is then somehow dispelled through my guy's foot is greater than I could have imagined. Who needs to simply sweep the leg to briefly knock someone over if you have the sheer force to knock it off? Inside the hotel, I'm able to cut loose even more and continue to bring new meaning to the term footloose. I suppose the power fist is just too much for the early game convicts to handle. Not that I'm complaining, watching them all get launched around is hilarious. I wish I'd gotten this run sooner. When I break Beagle out, I agree to bring Law back to the town, and for the first time in a while, I'm going to do that with the NCR. Figured if I'm going to be using the Ranger takedown, it thematically makes the most sense to side with the people who came up with the technique. I do the usual on the way to the outpost, slaughter the Jackals and Scorpions who are minding their own business. The Jackals are about the same as the Convicts, but the Rat Scorpions I do have to be a little bit more careful around. After all, to set up the hit I do need to stand next to them for a second, and I of course do not want to get poisoned. Normal rad scorpions and their babies are easy enough, again all one shots, plus they are approaching me so there is no issue landing the kicks. Arriving at the outpost I turn in the quest to Ranger Ghost and Sergeant Kilborn as I've already passed through Nipton so that makes this possible. I actually forgot that since my barter skill is high enough I can just convince Knight to send over the aid to Prim right away, but as I'm here now and a bit of an XP whore I agree to help Jackson out anyway. Plus kicking the ants in the face just sounded very satisfying. And it was. Seemingly having developed a hatred towards bugs of any and all varieties, I travelled back to Good Springs to begin duking it out with the giant rad scorpions that were just chilling near the graveyard. This was easily the toughest encounter yet, as while I was still laying on the damage, they were able to do just as much in return. I only survived thanks to coming prepared with some stim packs, as well as the sudden appearance of Victor. Actually, upon rewatching the footage, it seems like he just stood there and watched, so disregard that last part about him saving the day. I head down to Sloan from here to gain some more NCR rep by fixing Snuffles and the generator. After healing Snuffles, I reach level 5. This allows me to max out my unarmed skill, so now it's just a matter of getting the relevant perks, and perhaps a better weapon, to really push this build to its limits. I continue to spin the wind through the Bark Scorpions and Centaurs in and around Hidden Valley, simply because I can, and I figured I may need to help the Brotherhood out as spin kicking them to death didn't seem like a viable option at the time. Once the multi-legged mutant mistakes have been disposed of, I hopped on up the mountain to do what I do best. Apply much cheese to open a door I'm not supposed to, so that I may skip the annoying climb up the mountain. Tabitha was an interesting encounter. She's tougher than most enemies we've fought up to this point, so her shins don't just buckle after a single hit. But more importantly, not once does it knock her to the ground. Considering that's supposed to be the whole point of the move, it's a tad concerning. And to jump ahead a little, throughout the rest of this run, not once did it knock someone down by itself. The only time I was able to actually sweep somebody off their feet was when I coupled it with the Super Slam perk much, much later in the run. It's more than likely just a bug or a glitch as I've definitely seen it knocked down without perks before, and as this is New Vegas, a random bug coming out of the left field to make things a little bit more difficult is honestly par for the course at this stage. No matter, we will just offset the tripping by hopefully dealing more damage. Don't need to make them take a dirt nap if they are sleeping with the fishes after all. For now, I just head through the shortcut and make a quick stop in the Rapcom building to get the second hall tape for the Brotherhood. From here, I could have just walked up to Vegas, but I had some other stuff I wanted to do. Mainly to deal with the situation in Boulder City, as well as checking the merchants at the 188, just in case they had any mods for my power fist. Unfortunately, they didn't, but I was able to sell a bunch of useless weapons and armor that I picked up to get just enough caps to buy a second power fist. This will probably work out a lot cheaper than having to pay for repairs, so it seemed like a somewhat wise investment. When I do reach the cans, I initially planned to settle things peacefully, as I had even gotten my speech up to 50 for it. But in the moment, something came over me, and I figured it would just be more entertaining to kick them all to death, so that's exactly what I did. Jessup and his unnamed friend had nowhere to run, and as such, were barely able to put up any kind of resistance when we began to throw down. 
Once they were dealt with, I went outside to continue my spinning, as after all, it's a good trick that everyone should see. The NCR in the area probably did most of the work to be honest, but I was glad to assist any way I could. After freeing the prisoners, I reached level 8 and take the Stonewall perk. I really do not need this now, but I feel it will be pretty much mandatory if I wish to stand a single chance at beating the Legate later. Especially if I don't get a better weapon between now and then. Before pushing ahead, I mark Hoover Dam on the map for later, as well as grab the snow globe there for some easy cash once we meet house. I touched on the idea there of getting a better unarmed weapon. Off the top of my head, I can only think of one other decent one I could get for free, and quite easily at that. And it was the cram opener from Little Buster in Camp McCarran. Now, of course, the fastest way to get the weapon would be to pry it from his little cold dead hands, but that would also more than likely bring the entire might of the base down upon me, and again, I am planning to side with him today, so that doesn't seem like the smartest choice. Fortunately, you can get the weapon if you collect the three fiend leader's heads for the major, so I set out to do just that. I start with Driver Nefi as he is the closest to my current location, plus he is the hardest one for me to fight considering his golf swing is strong enough to knock me a few feet back, if not off balance completely. It also doesn't help that the entire time I'm trying to fight him, I also need to deal with his men. Specifically, this one fiend who was up top pelting me with lasers like a very accurate Preston. I thinned out most of the other adds before focusing on Nefi. The trick to overcoming the fight was honestly rather simple. All I had to do was block one of his attacks, and then while he was momentarily stunned from the recoil, land a single sweep to do some decent damage. After doing this a few times, he crumples like anything else, and his leg decides to go for a walk on its own. After dealing with the stragglers, I then turn my attention on Violet and Cook Cook. Not much to go over here, Violet, aside from her dogs, is no real different than any other fight with a fiend with a gun, and as for Cook Cook, well, I just go for the indirect route of dealing with him by engaging in some fairly aggressive cow tipping that results in him killing most of his backup. This very easily lets me swoop and sweep for the kill, and now I can toss all their soggy heads down at the Major's feet for a reward. We don't get Buster's cram opener just yet, rather we'll need to wait a few days for his corpse to randomly appear just next to the followers base on Freeside. Speaking of, that's where I'm off to next. Felt like I should mark it for convenience sake, plus who knows, maybe he's already there. On the way, I sold even more junk that I'd gathered to the Gunrunners, and got enough money to buy myself a set of reinforced Mark II combat armour. I'll lose out in some speed during combat, but I feel like my survivability is far more important. Upon entering Freeside, things got weird. Like normal, one of the children trying to dine on the rat greeted me. I, being the fool that I was, did not respond in kind, and as a result, right as I was passing the followers base, this happened. I have absolutely no idea what is happening, or better yet, why it is happening. Remember, I am on a Series X here, so no, I am not using console commands. Nor can I fix it with console commands. Changing from first to third person wouldn't fix anything, and my directions were really messed up. Like, while it looks like I am walking towards the kids here, and technically I am, I'm actually looking straight down so they aren't in front of me as much as they are below me. It's weird. Eventually, and somewhat randomly, things snap back to reality, and I leave. I could not get the game to replicate what just happened, which makes it even stranger. If you want to see the full 3 minutes of confusion, I uploaded it as its own short clip last week. With my brain now completely fried, I figured, to hell with it, I'm off to Nellis. I kill George, as I'm known to do, and then proceed to absolutely flex on the boomers by not only avoiding all of their artillery, but by doing so for a full 24 hours. Once I can no longer cope with the secondhand embarrassment, I enter their home and then begin to effortlessly fix all of their problems. The two skills I have been focusing on after maxing out my unarmed have been medicine and repair, so I can fix both the people and the panels no problem. As you are aware, I also practice the art of kicking ants really hard in the face, so clearing them out is also child's play. All that leaves is to listen to Pete's problems and it's off to raise the bomber. The most interesting part about all of this to me was whenever I was walking through Nellis, I was randomly approached by Victor. It's odd enough that he's in here, but what's even more impressive is that he somehow made it through the bombardment. We all know he has not been so fortunate in the past. Well, after I do raise the bomber, I don't head straight back to Nellis, as I'll need to come back here for Crocker in a little bit anyway to get their aid, so I figured I could just turn in the good news about the plane then. I suppose I should get on that, the whole meeting the NCR leaders thing. That means it's back to Freeside where I very carefully check to see if Buster's corpse is in the alley. It isn't, so I just sulk my way towards the strip, all the while making sure I don't annoy some otherworldly presence and get sucked back into the void. 
As soon as I step foot on the strip, I am asked to go pay house a visit, and for once I agree. Doing so causes the NCR messenger to come and find you the moment you leave, as opposed to having to get the platinum chip from Benny first. Speaking of, given the recent passing of Matthew Perry, I cannot bring myself to kill Benny today. So, for just this once, I am going to let him live and just not bother him by staying very far away from the tops. Meeting with Crocker, and like I said, he sends us straight back to the Boomers to enlist their support. We can wrap all this up nicely, as all we need to do is speak with Loyal and the... Hmm. After his quick dip in the concrete, he returns to our plane of existence, where I can then inform him of the status of the bomber. I then return to Pearl one final time to complete the Boomers' quest line, along with getting their assistance. On my way out of Nellis, I grab the last hall tape that should come in handy later. Next on the chopping block of tasks is to deal with the Kings. Before that, however, I would rather deal with the last few issues on the strip. One of those being my unbridled slaughter of the Omertas, because I find it funny, and the other is to permanently get rid of House. With me hell-bent on leaving Benny alone, and therefore no way to secure the Platinum Chip, we will need another way into his basement, as without the chip, I will need to bypass a hard terminal to open the wall. Of course, the simple solution is to just grind out levels until I reach 75 in science and hack my way in. I am not going to essentially just piss away that many skill points on something I'm only going to use once. So, plan B, it's back to the 188 where we can briefly travel north until we arrive at Camp Gulf. Inside the building, if we head into the room that Chief Hanlon likes to redecorate with his brain matter, we can find a Lucky 38 VIP keycard. This will let us bypass the terminal back at the Lucky 38. There is another copy of this keycard in the h and Tools Factory, but this one is just a bit more convenient to get. I was a little worried the Securitrons may give us trouble, and to be fair, they did. But it was nothing our spinning couldn't handle once we were able to close the gap. House is down here trying his absolute best to remain as clean as possible, so to help him out, I sweep some dust out of the antechamber. He jumps for joy at my help, and now I head back to Freeside, this time to sort out the Kings. Rather than do the GI Blue quests for like the 100th time, I decide to just go the assassination route by having it pinned on the Van Graffs. You would think I would need to use an energy weapon of some description for that to work, but no, simply killing him while working security is more than enough to point the blame away from the NCR. As I'm already here and haven't fully completed this quest in, no joke, like 10 years, I thought it would be fun to continue to help out the Van Graffs. Spoiler, it wasn't fun at all, it actually was kinda sad. Their next task is to just talk with a not-so-subtle undercover legionary to set up a deal, which is then followed by bringing Cass to John Baptiste so that he can murder her. I had no use for her in this run, obviously, but like, damn, that kind of sucks if you like her as a companion. Considering I am now an accomplice in her murder, I just go along with the final part of their plan, which is to pull the old ocelot switcheroo by turning on the legion at the very last moment and just murdering them with the assistance of some nearby NCR troopers. In the end, all you get is a thousand caps, so it's probably not really worth it, Oh well, I got some experience out of it, as well as some NCR reps, so that's nice, I suppose. After reporting back to Crocker and getting my assignment to wipe out the cans from the Colonel, I returned to Freeside yet again, and finally Buster's corpse had spawned. And it was really not worth the wait. It may be slightly faster than my Power Fist, but the drop-off in damage is just not worth it. So I do the only logical thing. I take it, along with all the money I got from selling snow globes to House's robo-wife, to Mick and Ralph's, and then use the money to buy the Embrace of the Mantis King. It may only do a little bit more than the Power Fist, but it is faster, has a higher crit chance, and does more crit damage. This, coupled with perks like Piercing Strike, which I have, and Finesse, which I also have, allows the Spin Kick to inflict a ridiculous amount of damage whenever I land a crit, which is very often. As you can see, it makes very short work of the cans, especially those inside the longhouse. The only real issue is the third person camera angles in there can get a little funky, making it difficult to see what I'm doing. Cleaning house outside is much more straightforward though, and as a result, it's not long before they're out of the picture. All that leaves is sorting out the issues with the Brotherhood of Steel. Now, like I said before, I came to the bunker with the intention to resolve matters peacefully. However, just out of curiosity, I wanted to see how effective the spinning mantis embraced kick would be on those in power armor. Okay, so I popped some psycho and medex beforehand for a little extra oomph, but even still, I was not expecting it to go this well. In fact, I ended up just wiping out the entirety of the Brotherhood like this. It came as quite a shock, I won't lie. I assumed I would maybe get through the first handful and then be eviscerated by those further on in, but that never happened. 
It's all down to luck in the end, obviously, as it was only when the clock crit that I did any real damage, but again, my crit chance is so high thanks to luck, finesse, the claw, and Boone's beret, that it's honestly harder to not land one. Can't stand up. Indeed, you can't stand up, Elder. Dare I say, that is the point. The hardest room was the one with all the scribes in it, believe it or not. Their zap fists, while not incredibly effective damage-wise, were able to stunlock me pretty hard with little effort. The trick, much like with Driver Nefi earlier, was just to hold block and wait for an opening. A little trickier this time due to there being multiple of them, but through enough patience I was able to make it through. After everyone was confirmed dead I destroyed the base, did all of the Crimson Caravan's quests for some reason, and then returned to the Colonel to take part in the protection of Kimball. There's nothing new here, it plays out the same as usual, only today the Sniper Ranger actually takes out the Legion Assassin all by himself, as I accidentally got overzealous with the sweeps and slid off the tar. Thankfully, I lived, and so did Kimball. That means we're near the end of the run, and it's time to fight through and across the dam. Some of the Centurions with better weapons proved to be a little tough, but thanks to the NCR backup, they couldn't just focus entirely on me. Everyone else was a critical one-shot until we made it to the Legates camp. The Praetorians with the Ballistic Fists are, like many enemies, easy enough to deal with one-on-one, -on -one, but as soon as their friends jumped in, it presented problems. This extended to attempting to fight the Legate with his reinforcements. I can't output the damage quick enough to deal with them, as I will get knocked out of my kick animation by the other swarms of enemies raining down on me all at the same time. Not to mention, the Ballistic Fist sends me pretty far back when hit. That also goes for the Legate's giant sword as well. So, on the next attempt, I just take out the Praetorians before the Legate one at a time. Except for these two. It's just really a matter of getting lucky that I can knock one away, and therefore only have to fight one at a time. When it's time to face Lanius, I just goad him into a duel instead. He can still dish out the damage consistently, as due to his height he is also faster than all human enemies, making him somewhat difficult to hit. Once more, it's all down to counter-attacking after a successful block. A couple of good crits start the second phase of the fight, where he starts healing. It's a little annoying, but nothing major. I opted to not heal to make things a bit more interesting. After a few more good criticals, the light finally goes down, and I am left with a literal sliver of health and a broken skull. As soon as it's over, I heal up right away, as due to his sword's bleed effect, I would have died otherwise. With that done, I approach the gate, Great the general, finishing the game, and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout New Vegas with only ranger takedowns. It was a pretty fun run. I mean, I enjoyed the pocket sand run, so that makes sense. It's almost exactly the same, just with less explosives mixed into the sand. I don't think I'm going to do one of the other special moves after this. I feel like two videos going over them is more than enough. Regardless, that's going to be the end of this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like. If you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe as I try to run these videos out fairly frequently. My name's Nerbits, I say for everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.